Well, let's go ahead and get started with the last session of today. Um, uh, for those of you who are joining us now, uh, just remember to submit your questions to the Q&A module and not the chat. That will be used for uh, troubleshooting purposes. Our um, sessions will also be recorded, so those will be available after the conference with the presentation slides if you want to go back and review those. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, our last uh, presentation is a 3D model creation and management in an academic digital repository uh, being presented by Marcia McIntosh, who is the digital production librarian at the University of North Texas. And I will hand it off to her. Thank you, Amanda. Um, as she said, I am uh, Marcia McIntosh I'm at the University of North Texas. And today I'm going to talk about a little project I got to experiment with over the last year. And um, hopefully uh, uh, enlighten anyone interested in going down the 3D path. So, uh, a quick agenda of where we'll be headed. I'll first introduce uh, a little bit about the University of North Texas. And if you're at the RTH presentation earlier, um, there will be some overlap. Um, and then we'll talk about the project's origin and um, give you a brief intro to some 3D scanning information and then dive into the case study. Um, last, we'll discuss my recommendation on 3D scanning and any um, mention some future areas of research that are right to be explored. So first off, um, the University of North Texas, or UNT, was established in 1890 in Denton, Texas, which is about 30 miles north of Dallas. We enrolled 37,973 students this uh, fall and are administered by 33,887 faculty and staff currently. Um, UNT is very supportive of its libraries and digital collections, and in particular, um, we, within, the digital, within the libraries, we have the Digital Libraries Division. Um, we are made up of several smaller units, the User Interfaces Group, the Software Development Group, a Digital Creation Group, and two Content Creation Labs, a Digital Newspaper and the Digital Projects Lab. Collectively, we support and develop the UNP Libraries Catalog, the library website, and host the Gateway to Oklahoma History, which is a repository um, that hosts materials from Oklahoma. Um, but we also create content for the Portal to Texas History and the UNT Digital Library and our two labs. Um, the Digital Newspaper Lab in particular is made up of four full-time staff and nine part-time students who digitize only newspaper, while the um, UNT uh, Digital Projects Lab or unit um, also has four full-time staff members and approximately 22 student workers who are part-time and do the majority of our digitization and metadata creation. Um, while, uh, the, while we do not do newspapers or audio or video material, the, we do a lot of everything else, including photographs, letters, reports, books, maps, architectural drawings, and negatives, among other things. Um, and now we've uh, dabbled in some 3D uh, items as well. So the impetus for this project came in the form of a call for uh, grant proposals internally uh, by our Dean of Libraries. Um, I was encouraged to apply, and it occurred to me that we do a lot of two-dimensional flat uh, scanning here in the lab, and why not explore 3D scanning? Um, I had no real experience with 3D, uh, but I researched the idea and found some examples of ways of going about it. And I also went and visited our special collections librarian and um, librarians, and they helped me to identify some possible collections that could uh, utilize 3D scanning. Um, in particular, we looked at so, um, some Texas, uniquely shaped Texas glass and um, some toys, um, in, as well as uh, books in their miniature book collections that would uh, do well for 3D scanning. So in uh, spring of 2015, I applied and was awarded $3,750 um, to, to, uh, to explore, investigate 3D scanning, do a case study, and um, provide a recommendation. So that's kind of going to be the outline for us um, going forward. The first step um, we should probably explore, though, is uh, why 3D? So in my opinion, 
I find that uh, a 3D scanning and a three-dimensional modeling provides a fuller experience of an object as it exists in the real world. It's uh, closer to recreating that object um, and preserving it um, as close to the original as we can. So in the same way that we scan, say, a photograph, um, you want to scan it at a high resolution to get as much information from it as possible. You want to scan the whole thing, both sides, with borders, just so you can get as much from that object and represent it as well as you can in the digital area. And I think the same applies for 3D. Um, second, uh, with the help of 3D printing, 3D scanning also provides a quick option for recreation of a physical object. For example, if you had a piece of, uh, piece of your furniture that had fallen off, and you didn't know how to replace it, but if you 3D scanned it and printed it, you could probably get that replacement back in a fairly quick time. Um, and, uh, and also in terms of like just what we do as librarians, it uh, helps us preserve and have access to those things and spaces that we don't normally have access to. For example, um, things that are far, far away or um, items that we shouldn't handle uh, frequently. So initially, and along the way, I learned of a lot of other institutions who I explored 3D scanning um, for purposes similar to mine or completely different reasons. Um, I found three kind of main ones within cultural heritage institutions. Um, some of them approached 3D scanning to preserve and provide access to their collections and artifacts, as was the case of, uh, say, Smithsonian's X3D work. Um, others have looked at ways to preserve the 3D models that are created by their faculty, particularly, say, in archaeology or something. And this was the case locally in Texas at Stephen S. Austin University. Um, and some have explored how to offer 3D scanning as a service to their constituents. I found this is the case to be at uh, Pennsylvania State University. Um, the aim of my project was the first and second of these points um, to scan and provide access to special collection items and to upload those items into our digital repository. Although I do have hope that one day we could offer it as a service maybe. So what is 3D scanning, you may be asking? Well, like 2D digitization, 3D scanning creates a digital representation of a physical object. In the same way that 2D digital images use dots per inch or DPI to create an image, 3D models use thousands to billions of points situated on three coordinates, X, Y, and Z, to recreate a physical object in digital space. And depending on what kind of scanner you have, information about the color and appearance may also be captured. So there are a few ways of capturing this data. Um, for example, CT scanning or computed tomography, white light scanning, photogrammetry or image-based capture, um, contact scanning or digitizing and laser scanning. CT scanning is a term you're probably familiar with using the medical field. It's the capture of the internal structure of an object. White light scanning is similar to another form of scanning, laser scanning, but it, it, but it is considered uh, more accurate to a certain degree, but also slower as it only captures uh, via grid of light one shot of the object at a time. Photogrammetry is compiled 2D photographic images that uh, captures extremely detailed graphical three-dimensional views of an object from each angle. It does not, however, provide a record of the object's actual surface geometry or physical structure. And contact scanning or digitizing makes use of a probe to gather data point information. It is best used to capture the shape of a geometric object that can be handled and uh, contact scanners don't work really well with really big or delicate objects. Um, these large and delicate items are more safely and quickly scanned with laser scanners. Um, like contact scanners, a laser scanner gathers surface data about an object in a particular field of view, um, but uses a laser instead of a probe. So the scanner I selected for this project was chosen based on its accuracy in comparison to other scanners, its resolution capacity, and its price. I also found that there were other institutions using this scanner and it offered support and documentation for um, inexperienced operators. That scanner is, of course, the Next Engine HD 3D scanner. Um, the scanner can, comes with a large rectangle the size, the size of about a, a small serial box and a turn cable, which is attached to the serial box scanner. Um, it also comes with a stand 
and um, a kind of stand holder so we can position and hold very small or large items. Um, also inside the uh, kit is a, another box that includes materials for make, uh, easing the skinning process. In that box is a square of orange putty that can be remolded to orient an object so you can get different angles. Paint pins for making alignment spots on an object and a pin full of white powder that can be uh, applied to the physical object to reduce reflex reflectivity. The mixed engine scanner uses four lasers and two cameras to collect data of the object in a process called optical triangulation. The four beams of light are projected onto this object's surface and sensed by two cameras. The object is also photographed at each angle. Spatial coordinates of each individual point are then calculated from this information by the next engine software, and, it pro and then it then processes the information and generates a 3D model. And the model come in, comes in uh, four view varieties. There's full color, shaded, mesh, and points. The full color view shows the object with its color rendering. The shaded view exhibits the shaded geometry of the object and provides a better view of the sur surface topography without color. The mesh view shows how the object is formed through polygons, and the points view exhibits dot the data of the object on a dot level. So the next step um, after acquiring the scanner was uh, um, securing what objects we would be scanning. I, I initially planned and identified that um, with the two special collection librarians, um, the unique Texas produced glass bottles and toys from the Alexander M. Troop collection and several items from the miniature book collection. It was discovered after pre preliminary testing with an extension that translucent materials could not be fully scanned without the addition of powder or scanning spray, as is traditional for 3D scanning materials in other fields. But since I was working with special collections items, I could not uh, powder or spray them, and so it was decided that we probably shouldn't scan the glass bottles um, and would choose other specimens. So we focused mainly on scanning materials from their mini triple collection, as you can see here. Um, so there were certain things, uh, certain qualities about each object that stand better than others. I tried to pick books that had unique textural features. Um, I, preferred, I preferred the older books that had clasps or that were securely bound um, or really tightly bound or solid objects. Um, Non-shiny or dull materials were also preferred um, and are actually described by other 3D scanners as being um, more easily scanned. I also learned which, book, which books were um, not that great for scanning. Uh, for example, um, translucent materials such as colored glass or anything see-through poised an issue, and I was hoping maybe that if it was surrounded by something solid that it would still work, and it really didn't. Um, in general, I would suggest uh, solid, stationary, opaque, and matte objects with interesting tactile natures as the best options for easy scanning. Also, towards the end of the project, uh, one of the aforementioned uh, special collections librarians identified the possibility of scanning movable type casting hand molds. Um, these are 15th century inventions made of two metal and wood pieces that hold the impression piece of a, of, uh, of a piece of type um, called a matrix. Um, and uh, the, this, the mold itself contained very hot um, liquid alloy metal that is poured into the mold to cast this piece of type. The process is kind of difficult to explain without the hand mold pieces and accessories to use as examples, and, but these pieces aren't actually all that easily acquired. So uh, the idea of 3D scanning them and providing um, uh, access to this data so that people who would want um, these pieces to 3D print would have them was uh, embarked upon. Um, so uh, we acquired, in partnership with Texas A&M, uh, uh, gathering those materials and 3D scanning them. But that's um, all I'll say for that project. Um, you can hear more about that this summer and spring. So where did I learn um, 3D scanning and where can, really can you learn 3D scan? The first step was um, really getting familiar with my scanner, um, as well as the support uh, network that uh, NextEngine provides the people who buy their, um, their equipment. 
Um, they have an online handbook that kind of walks you through the basics of scanning, and they uh, allow you to ask questions on how to improve uh, your scans and uh, uh, the process, as well as help you should there be any type of heart mal malfunctions. Um, in addition to Next Engine, I also uh, tried to uh, click into the uh, 3D modeler and scanner community, particularly on Sketchfab. Um, I also learned a lot you, um, after I settled on um, two open source softwares to use for processing my, mo my models. Um, Mesh Mixer and MeshLab were my favorites, and they had some information on how to use the material, but a lot of it, most of it came um, through studying videos on YouTube, and it, they were good at really targeting specific problems that I was having. Last, I talked to a lot of people who were um, 3D scanning themselves. Um, they provided advice on what worked and what didn't work, and mistakes they made, and um, helped can they help guide uh, new scanners through the process? And um, uh, the last one in particular, 3D Hubs and um, the makerspace here at UNT were great when I started printing my molds and they were um, helpful in giving feedback on how to do um, that process correctly. So uh, now that we have the material selected, the scanner set up, and some information on how to scan, I embarked, embarked on creating models for the miniature books. Um, to begin the scanning process, you position the object on the turntable and turn on the Scan Studio software that runs the next engine scanner. Uh, in the scanning, in the settings page, um, one makes sure that the whole item is in view during a 360 degree turn. Then uh, select how many divisions um, you want scanned. So eight was uh, kind of the standard and favorite of myself and uh, other scanners that I've talked to. It's approximately a 45 degree angle on each, uh, each turn, and uh, information is captured at each of those 45 degree angles. Um, the target its exposure setting was also selected to adjust for the amount of laser light actually directed upon the object. Um, there are three options, dark, neutral, and light. A dark colored object will require uh, the dark option, and a light colored object, uh, such as one that had a lot of reflectivity um, and that needed or would have desired to be powdered white, would require neutral or light. And um, after selecting the target, you would also select the resolution. I found using the second HD setting um, worked well for getting detailed scans, but also did not crash um, the software. <laughs> And then you select um, how near or far you want the object positioned to the scanner so that um, you can get as much information, have it be in focus um, as you can. There were two settings. Macro um, indicated that the object was between 7 and 11 inches away from the scanner. And um, Y indicated that it was somewhere between 22 and approximately 27 inches away from the scanner. So uh, before uh, starting each scan, I would record what settings I selected and the name of the object I was scanning and the date. Um, in the beginning, I tried to actually uh, compare real time with actual estimated time, but that turned out being un to be unrealistic because I would have to sit for each scan for approximately 40 minutes, and um, there, that there's just not enough time to do all of that uh, for every single scan that I took. Um, it was also discovered that I wasn't sure if we needed to use ambient light or if I had to stand in the dark. So I did a few tests and um, it was discovered no real difference between ambient and dark. So I ended up using ambient light for uh, most of the scanning as well so I could do it um, during the day. Um, once, the, uh, once the settings had been selected and um, other data had been captured, each scan took approximately 40 minutes. Um, for the eight divisions. Um, if, if, say, you wanted to do just like three divisions, which we call a bracket, that takes about 15 minutes. Um, and then after that first 360 degree turn, you would rotate the object approximately 90 degrees or so that any data that was missed during that first 360 degree turn would be visible to the scanner during the second one. And then you would scan it again for around a total of 80 or more minutes per scan or per object. So uh, following the actual scanning process, which is relatively easy, is a uh, post-processing phase. This part can be more or less complex depending on the initial capture 
of the data. Um, the turntable always appears in the uh, a, a scan uh, that you create. So the first step is really to try and trim off that piece without uh, affecting the, the, the mold that you want kept. Um, so I did this step in the scan studio software, although it is, um, there is a possibility of being able to do that in other software. And um, it was suggested by other uh, 3D scanners. Um, after trimming off the data, um, you align the two uh, 360 degree scans um, using points that you set in approximately the same position and um, then refine that alignment so that it's uh, as close as possible as it can be. Next, you fuse the two pieces together so that they create a, a, a whole, if not a full mesh. And you can see there um, that this is uh, the fused uh, uh, example. So after this step, um, there were uh, the, the, there, there will be further processing need to be done on the model depending on its uh, state. Um, so uh, some objects were better shaped and suited for easy scanning and require less processing. And the aim of all models is really to create a watertight and whole representation of the object. Um, I found this to be my goal in particular because I decided early on that I was going to try and work with uh, SCL files, which is what you use more for 3D printing, as opposed to OBJ files, which is what uh, is the more textured view of the object. So uh, after post-processing in Scan Studio, I would export the model into an SCL. And I additionally kept the OBJ version of the files, but wasn't able to use them because of the software I, and hardware I was using. Um, so, but I did keep them and um, they, they are available on, in our digital repository, just not in their um, post-processed state. So um, after uh, exporting them into STL files, um, there usually were three issues that came about with the model. Um, A, the size of the model, um, and that is in, in the, how much uh, memory it picks up. Um, the number of holes in the model and its overall appearance. And I found trying to fix these issues in MeshLab and Mex Mixer, Mesh Mixer be the best place to do that. Um, first was uh, filling the holes in the model. So um, here the uh, model, the actually it's called Miniature Cron, is in Mesh Mixer and we're using an analysis uh, tool to locate the holes which are represented by the blue dots and other significant issues that are represented by the red dots. And Mesh Mixer um, let you automatically repair these or do them by hand depending on um, the, the model you were, you were working with. This uh, tool worked out really well sometimes, but other times it really didn't. So I also um, use Mesh Lab to um, use an algorithm, algorithm called a Poisson filter that allowed um, me to not only fill the holes uh, without seriously affecting the, the model, but also um, uh, uh, removing static from the, uh, from the object. Um, in addition to uh, kind of cleaning up the appearance of the model, we also wanted to reduce the size of it, um, a process called decimation. And here you can see that uh, the, tar the target number of faces is nine, 923,110. And um, the goal is always, uh, or was suggested by several people to be try to get it under a million. And so you can reduce the size even further by percentage, um, so we keep half that number and uh, still kind of keep it cheap. Um, so the last issue uh, was the overall appearance. And um, and was uh, was fixing the overall appearance, and uh, that that was done with the plus one filter. So uh, after um, fixing the holes, fixing the size, and fixing the overall appearance, I usually sent the models out for three D printing. Um, so uh, this step in the workflow uh, was not only fun but also extremely beneficial because um, the gentleman often gentlemen um, who printing the materials would give feedback on how to do things better and also um, suggested tools 
to use, uh, for example, I learned about a automatic um, model cleaner uh, designed by Microsoft that uh, could inspect your model and reduce its size sometimes um, through uh, one of the contacts uh, that I was using to print. Um, next, um, next question asked was, after exploring 3D scanning, can Unity libraries, digital libraries, support 3D files? Well, um, let's start off with the idea of metadata. Um, uh, the metadata was embarked upon using the physical objects um, UNT digital UNT catalog record. I selected the information that best suited the 3D model that was representing it and also linked to the physical objects catalog record in the metadata record. Um, the project used the established metadata standards for our UNT libraries digital collections. Um, I, of the possible 21 fields, I used approximately 15 of them. Title, creator, contributor, publisher, date, language, description, subject, coverage, collection, institution, resource type, format, identifier, and note. Um, the main difference in describing a 3D model emerged um, in how UNT digital collections understands its uh, digital files relationship to its physical object um, that, that they represent. Um, these uh, differences were manifested in the date, description, and resource type fields. For example, in the date field, traditionally we use the creation date of the object being represented, the physical object being represented. I decided in conjunction with the UNT metadata and digital projects department head that this date would be misleading and confusing to our potential model users. Say for example, a book uh, created or published in the 1850s. If I were to put 1850s for a 3D model, that would be kind of like, oh, that's not right. Um, so uh, we instead decided to use the date that the model was created, so in this case, 2016, um, and would reference the physical object's date of creation in our coverage field. Um, we also uh, decided how to represent the physical object in our uh, content description field. Um, so rather than, so for example, if you have a letter, you would say a, a scan letter of, a scan letter by Stephen F. Austin. Um, oh, I'm sorry, let me repeat that. So rather than describe a scan of a letter in the content description field as a scan of a letter by Stephen F. Austin, we would usually put a letter written by Stephen F. Austin. Um, uh, again, with guidance, I found that that kind of description was inappropriate for 3D models, that it was better to um, try and represent the model as a model rather than pretend like it was a, a miniature book with uh, pages and content inside. So we usually described the model as a 3D model of blank object and then apply any description from its physical object that was relevant to its 3D model. Um, also, the decision on how to describe the kind of uh, resource manifested by the novel, represented by the model, also gave me pause. There are a few options. Um, physical objects, book, image, and data set. We ended up picking data set um, because the 3D model data was, was going to be uploaded into the repository, as well as the kind of printable access type, the printable access model. Um, uh, so not only would you get one that you could print out, but you would get the raw data so that uh, any user who might want to could process it on their own. Um, uh, we also included a readme.txt file in with the models that I will describe later. Um, it included information including the file sizes of each of the models and our Creative Commons uh, public domain license CC0 was chosen for them. So the next step um, after the metadata was preparing the models for printing. So ideally, um, it would be desired that you have a manipulable object so that one could turn the object within the digital repository system. However, we um, did not do that. We selected instead to represent the model in a few different ways. First off, we created pins of it so that the model could be uh, viewed at all angles without necessarily needing a 3D viewer to look at it. Um, secondly, we created a GIF of it so that you could see it turning in the round as one would if they were to um, 
uh, be manipulating it in, in, a, in a modeling system. Um, and then we also uh, added models, the three versions of the model in our system. So as you can see there, there's a print version, a raw version, and a textured version. The print version is the one that I post-processed. The raw version is the STL version that has no processing done to it outside of cleaning out um, the stand from the uh, original scan. And then the textured version is the OBJ or the one that has the color on it. And then of course we added the readme and um, metadata uh, files um, to create a full package for this one particular object. And so here's an example of uh, one of the models in our UMP digital library. And, um, and then here are the models where you can find them. And um, this particular view is available under all, uh, all files and all formats. So uh, we've explored 3D scanning. We've learned that UMP libraries can support 3D files. Next, um, I was asked to, or I said I would recommend um, whether UNT should pursue 3D scanning in the future. But first, let's say, look at my results. So um, the numbers I took to scan, um, we, we, we plan to upload 43 of them, 27 of them are miniature books, and 16 of them will be related to the book history project. Um, of those, I printed uh, 23 of them. 3D printing, it turns out, is also a learning process, so some of them were duplicates. And um, a number, I, I ended up taking over 235 scans um, that I had recorded on that spreadsheet. So um, there are many unexplored questions. Um, so needless to say, I would suggest that um, the UNT libraries continue uh, with 3D scanning and that they, um, they um, consider uh, a few uh, ways to, to look at it, for example, um, what are the scanning and processing standards that could be established for 3D scanning? Um, is, is there another way to represent this particular format that we are thinking about in metadata based on 2D and um, flat objects? Um, what copyright issues do we run in with uh, copying a physical object that um, is someone else's idea? And um, how can we have viewers in, um, non-proprietary viewers in our in institutional repositories that allow us to manipulate our models um, without having to pay, say, a monthly fee. And um, how are our scans being used by our users? Um, not only like the data, but actually uh, what are they doing with printed models? Like what kind of printed models would they like to see? Um, so yes, I think UNT libraries should continue scanning, but I think um, we should explore some other perspectives. Particularly, I want to know um, how my models, um, both the miniature books and the hand mold project, are, will be used. Um, and I think we would need to upgrade our uh, 3D processing software and um, potentially look into modeling software too, and also invest in the faster computers and um, uh, uh, and faster computers and more memory and um, also um, there are of course going to be more technologies coming out different scanning equipment that might make the process more efficient and um, uh, a little less heavy weight. So um, we have explored 3D scanning, um, we have seen that UNT libraries can support 3D files and uh, yes we definitely should do uh, 3D scanning in the future. So I'd like to thank um, my grant um, pr provider, Greenlight Greatness UNT Libraries, um, especially the collections department for helping me uh, gather materials to scan, uh, UNT Digital Libraries for their assistance in uh, metadata and uploading of materials, UNT Makerspace, um, the factory for helping me print things, um, 3D hub owner Bob and Makertree uh, for their advice and guidance in the process. Any questions? All right, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Um, let's see, so um, we have a few questions here and if any of you who are listening have questions of your own, please add them to the Q&A. 
Um, the first question that I've got here is, after investigating 3D scanning, are you going to incorporate this into your regular digitization workflow? Um, that would be ideal. Um, however, I would want to make sure that we have a process that um, isn't terribly time consuming and worthwhile before doing so. And I don't necessarily feel that we have that at this point. Um, it's still very experimental and in a research phase. Okay. Um, the next question, where can we access this collection? Um, so if you look in the UNT Digital Libraries, I, um, UNT, if you Google UNT Digital Library and the Miniature Books Collection, it should, there are 10 mold models up there so far that you should be able to see and uh, view and download. Okay. Um, the next question, how much training do you anticipate you will be doing um, to train people on the 3D scanner? Um, well, I'm actually I'm just starting to uh, kind of, uh, one of the students showed interest, and so I, we've created a wiki page, which is how we usually start off our scanning, or started off our training, and um, having her go through it to uh, go through the process and see where she has more questions or what's more explanation will probably be the first step, and then um, having her kind of experiment it with the process, because right now, scanning isn't, it isn't straightforward for every object, so it's really a, try and fail kind of system. Okay. Um, is the handling of the 3D files different from 2D files? And if so, how? Um, so that is a good question, particularly for our systems administrator. Um, but from what I could tell when I first approached him about it, he's like, yeah, we could probably do that. Um, he did have trouble making the GIFs actually rotate in the browser. And I'm not actually sure how he did that. So I will have to ask him back to you, but um, that was probably the biggest difficulty. The others were uh, actually fairly uh, similar to work that we've done before. Um, he, he was able to capture Twitter data and um, store it in our data repository, and it was pretty much similar to that. Okay. Um, what's the maximum size the scanner can handle? Um, I... Uh, that is a good question as well. Um, I, I usually have, I hadn't actually measured the size, but if, if you put the scanner back to 27 inches away from its viewer, um, you wanna make, just make sure that the object can really fit into that, um, into, into its space. Um, that is a good question. I, 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 I'm actually not sure, uh, but uh, it's really, you can either try it that way. You could also try scanning it in pieces and then just stitching all those pieces together. So it's really how much time you have how much in, and how much ingenuity and if you're willing to kind of go beyond its capacity. Okay. Um, what was the learning curve in learning how to edit the 3D files? Um, did you decide on what software to use moving forward when editing 3D files? That was actually really tricky. Um, there are a lot of 3D editing softwares out there, some of which you have to purchase. Um, I, I, I stuck with the ones that I chose basically because I could find information on how to use them, not only just uh, editing the material, but actually how to just manipulate the objects in that, in that soft, and the software changes between different softwares. Um, the learning curve, I'd say, is kind of steep, but um, if you're willing to try and fail and keep trying, then I would say it's not impossible to climb. Okay. Um, did you develop in-house the 3D viewer in your repository? We have not, no. Um, no. At this point, we're, we are going with uh, the two D pings and um, the GIF representation, but we hope to um, have one. We, we would like to develop one. Okay. Um, I know you said that this was an area for future research, but do you have any initial sense of how users are interacting with the 3D scans? I don't yet know. I, I do not know. Um, one idea is, of course, to create a survey to ask people if they are viewing or downloading um, the, or those materials, if they would be interested in answering questions as to what they intend to do with them. Um, I know from experience that like before sending my first uh, th actually scan model, I downloaded some from like a repository online just to like test out the process. So I, I don't know. 
Okay. Um, I think the last question I've got right now is where were you providing the descriptive metadata for the 3D digital objects? Um, so it's located both on our kind of summary view of the object, like when you first look at it, it'll be on the right side. But if also if you go into the full detail tab at the top, um, that should provide all the metadata for the object. Okay, um, let's see. What digital preservation program is being used to preserve the scans? So the, 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 uh, our system is uh, locally developed um, using open source um, tools and software. Um, it's the same system that we use for our portal to Texas history and UNT Digital Library. Basically we have, um, we create archival copies, um, save them on two, uh, two servers, one locally, one remotely, and, um, and then provide access copies to those materials through um, our digital repositories. So they are preserved um, in case and in one case by locks and um, uh, and, um, and it's not really like a um, let's see, kind of system that you can uh, go out and purchase or um, it, download whole hog. Okay. Um. So it looks like. That's all the questions that have come in at this point. We still have a little bit more time. If anyone has any additional questions, go ahead and add them to the Q&A. All right. Um, well, it looks like that might be all the questions at this point. If there are any additional questions, um, those can be sent to the presenter and answered by email afterwards. 